This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Let's go through and have a look at a standard that you've previously seen at F7 level. Uh, you even touched upon it if memory serves me right at F3 level, ever so briefly. Uh, it's looking at provisions, contingent assets, contingent liabilities, which is covered by IS37. Uh, it's a great standard to apply within P2 because there's plenty to go through there and discuss within the world of provisions. So what you've got in order to go through there and create a provision, remember you'll go to credit your provision and debit your statement to profit or loss, uh, is that you need a present obligation. So tying back in uh, to the definition of a liability from the framework. Uh, present obligation as a result of a past event that gives an outflow of economic benefit. The way in which IS37 takes that a little bit further is that it looks at the obligation and talks about that obligation being created either through legislature, so a legal obligation, or also a constructive obligation. Now, a constructive obligation uh, is an established pattern of past practice uh, or whereby you have created the obligation uh, through communication publicly, maybe via your website. So even maybe there is no legal obligation to clear up environmental damage. Maybe you have a clear green policy published on your website. Therefore, that creates the obligation via a constructive obligation. So IS37 extends the rules uh, or the principles, I should say, within the framework that little bit further by talking about how the obligation is constructed via either a legal or a constructive obligation. Uh, if we're tying things back again into the framework and the principles, the measurement principles are that there are a probable outflow and we can measure it reliably, which is what you can see up there. However, again, when we're talking about the words probable, the standard talks about that being more likely than not, which we take as being more than a 50% chance of that actually happening. Okay. In terms of the reliable measurement, the standard goes through there and gives you some additional rules about reliable measurements. Uh, we want to make sure that it is the best estimate of the expenditure that we are going to pay out. Uh, however, uh, do be careful when you're comparing the best estimate versus your expected values. A lot of people get confused. You know, the best estimate of expenditure is saying, look, it's probable that you are going to lose a court case. Yeah, and there is a 70% chance that you will pay 10 million, but there is a 30% chance that you will pay 2 million. There is only one possible outcome. You're going to lose that court case. So you go with the best estimate and the best estimate is the best estimate being 70% chance. Uh, it's more likely that you're going to pay the 10 million than the 2 million. So you would make your provision for $10 million. Credit provision, debit the expense, $10 million. Be very careful you don't that get that confused with your expected values. Expected values are where there are various different outcomes. So there is more than one outcome that is going to go through and happen. So maybe that's looking at a warranty or a repairs provision. Yeah, with the court case, there's only one outcome. Yeah, you will lose the court case or it's probable that you will lose the court case. Under expected values, there is more than one outcome. There's going to be more than one type of repair. There could be minor repairs. There could be major repairs. So what you need to look at there is how much you go to spend on major repairs, how much you're going to spend on minor repairs, how much will require no repairs whatsoever and work out an expected value based upon the percentages and the values that you are given. And once you've worked out that expected value, then yes, by all means, go through there and record that figure as your provision. Debit the expense, credit the provision. Happy with that? Be careful in the exam. Uh, the other situation in terms of the measurement is involving measurement criteria. Uh, so remember, we spoke about historic cost, current cost, realizable value, present value. Well, that's what we have here. If the amount that you are going to pay in the future is materially different. So again, coming back to things being relevant, if they are material, 
yeah, coming back to today's value, if it is materially different to what you've set up in the future, you discount it back to present value. So your common scenario there would be your decommissioning costs of an item of property, plant and equipment that will be decommissioned, say, in 10, 15 or 20 years. So maybe you have an oil rig, you need to decommission it at the end of its life. You work out the present value of the decommissioning costs. You credit the provision and debits, remember, the property, plant and equipment. Don't debit an expense. You debit your PPE and then that PPE is then subsequently depreciated. Just be careful where you've worked out the provision at present value. Don't forget you then need to unwind that discount. So increasing the provision up to its final value. So you need to credit the provision, debit your finance costs each year using the percentage that you used originally to discount things back to present value. Okay, excellent. If we just go through, move things on ever so slightly, uh, and think about the subsequent treatment of your provision, uh, you need to review that provision annually if it's there for several years and ensure that it is still the best estimate of expenditure. If not, you adjust it and any adjustments go through profit or loss. Uh, and you can only use the provision for the expense that it was originally created for. OK, excellent. There we go. Uh, in terms of contingent liabilities, uh, so we have a contingent liability if there is a, a possible obligation. So you're not too sure if you've done anything wrong. OK, uh, or maybe you have done something wrong, but there is only a, a possible transfer. So... Whenever we're talking about possible, but we're talking about less than 50% chance of it actually happening. Or alternatively, maybe you cannot measure the outflow reliably. That's unlikely to happen. You know, if you have the obligation, if there is a probable outflow, the reason why it's probable outflow is that you know that it's going to happen and you know how much it will be. So that last scenario there is very, very, very rare. If you have a contingent liability, what's the treatment for a contingent liability? Can you remember? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we disclose a contingent liability, don't we? Uh, we can disclose the financial effects and we disclose a narrative explaining how and why that situation has arisen, isn't it? Again, just be careful. A contingent liability under IS37 we disclose, don't we? But a contingent liability within the group accounts, within a subsidiary on acquisition under IFRS3, we recognise it at fair value if it can be measured reliably. Yeah, because that contingent liability may be the reason why we have a discount on acquisition, the reason why we have paid less for the subsidiary than what it is actually worth at fair value. OK, so do just be aware of the different treatment uh, for IS37 for a contingent liability where we disclose it and IFRS3, whereby you recognise it at fair value if we can measure it reliably. OK, excellent. Uh, over the page, I think you've got, is it an example uh, about provisions and contingent liabilities? Uh, it says, explain how York should account for the above environmental cleanup costs in its financial statements. So it says there, York operates in the oil industry and is regularly involved in the contamination of land, seas and rivers, given the nature of its business. Okay. It does, however, have a publicised environmental policy on its website. And in its annual report, it states that it will clean up any environmental damage incurred. And by that, what that goes through and does is that that goes through there and creates your constructive obligation, doesn't it? So even though there may not be a legal obligation, there is a constructive obligation and you need to go through there, don't you? And record that amount as a provision if you have any cleanup costs to incur. OK, and it says it is currently involved in three major projects with the cost of cleaning up the contamination and the local laws regarding environmental cleanup are given. Well, effectively, the local laws are irrelevant, aren't they? Because we have a constructive obligation. So even though we have four, five and six million and for the first one, it says there is a law. Well, great. There is a law. So a legal obligation. And we already have our constructive obligation. Uh, but in the second one, you know, five million, there is no law. Well, it, it makes no difference because we have 
a constructive obligation, don't we? And if we have a constructive obligation, we are going to provide for it. So we're going to provide for the four million. We're going to, we're going to provide for the five million as well because we have that constructive obligation. And even with the six million, it says the law to enforce the clean up of environmental damage will come into force in the next accounting period. OK, uh, but we're currently involved in the project. It's going to cost us six million in the future. We have a constructive obligation, so we will provide as well for the six million dollars. So the actual provision will be in total is that 15 million dollars. And the reason why it's 15 and, and nothing different is because of what we've mentioned at the top. The fact that we have a constructive obligation by publishing the policy in our website, by stating in our report that we will clean up any damage incurred as that damage has already been incurred. We need to make the provision because we have the constructive obligation. OK, and the key with any scenario to do with provisions is it's all about the obligation. If you have an obligation there is a, a distinct likelihood that you will have to make a provision. OK, so do just be on the lookout for whether or not there is an obligation. This is where P2 comes into its own, because if there's no obligation, so maybe there is a possible obligation, then all of a sudden, instead of having a provision, we have a contingent liability, don't we? And we can discuss what we need to do with regards to a contingent liability. But none of the situations here give rise to contingent liabilities they give rise to provisions okay uh, if we just go through and look at things in a little bit more detail uh, there are some specifics that are mentioned within the standard uh, to do with provisions and is 37 uh, the first one is future operating losses if a business is anticipating mating losses in the future then no provision is going to be made businesses would love to provide for those losses in the future to get rid of them so that we can then be more profitable into the future at an earlier date. Uh, the reason why there is no provision is because there is no obligation. You're not obliged to make losses. Okay, There's no legal obligation. There's no constructive obligation either, is there? Okay, uh, An onerous contract, you've got the definition there. Uh, an onerous contract is whereby the cost of fulfilling the contract exceed the benefits received from the contract. So a non-cancellable operating lease. So maybe you have a lease of some premises. You know how much it is going to cost you uh, to lease the property until the end of the lease period. But you decide to move away from the premises and rent some other premises. Uh, you might sublet the premises if you're allowed to, but it's still an onerous contract because the benefits that you get, the income, uh, from subletting the property is likely to be less than the cost of fulfilling the contract. OK, so the key bit is that the costs exceed the benefit. The outflows exceed the inflows. If that's the case, you have an onerous contract. OK, however, when you're recognising that onerous contract, we recognise a provision at the lower of uh, the present value of continuing under the contract so maybe you have the option to go through there and sublet the property okay uh, so essentially continuing with the contract uh, but getting somebody else to pay the rent okay or the present value of exiting the contract okay so if you decided just to terminate it and not to sublet it and just pay the lease rentals and not let it out to anybody else because it was just too much hassle then if that was lower then you will provide for that amount. And you may be thinking, well, why the lower? Surely we want to be prudent with the expense and that to be prudent, we recognise a loss and we want to recognise the loss immediately, don't we? So surely the higher the expense would be better. Well, we take a, a more logical approach here, yeah, a more economic reality approach, because the lower expense that is created is surely what you would do, wouldn't you? You know, if it was cheaper overall to sublet the property, and that's what you would do, isn't it? OK, you wouldn't just terminate the contract. You'd sublet the property because that would be of the most economic benefit to the business, wouldn't it? So we go with the lower of either continuing or exiting the contract. OK, so do just be aware if that was to appear. And again, don't forget, uh, you may have to discount it back to present value. OK, 
Uh, in terms of a restructuring, uh, a lot of that has happened in recent times. Uh, restructurings tend to appear in line with IFRS 5 as well because you have a discontinued operation. Uh, you have the examples or the scenarios that give rise to a potential restructuring provision. Uh, so the sale or closure of a line of business. Uh, the ceasing of activities in a geographical location. So I think Tesco's in the UK uh, has closed down operations in America and Korea recently. Uh, so they are geographical locations. It's still carrying on with its line of business in the UK in terms of uh, a supermarket and selling groceries and, and other aspects. Uh, it could be that you relocate your activities from one place to another. So maybe you were operating in London and it was very expensive and you've relocated uh, up to, say, Manchester, uh, which is what the BBC did, uh, and they had to restructure. Uh, or likewise, maybe there's a reorganisation in terms of the management. You, ha you were a bit management heavy, so you've removed some levels of management and therefore had to make people redundant. Okay. Uh, key bit is in terms of making the provision for the restructuring is you have to have communicated it. So there needs to be a detailed formal plan and the plan has actually been announced. OK, if it hasn't been announced, if it hasn't been communicated externally, then you haven't yet created the obligation. Remember, the important thing was all about the obligation, wasn't it? OK, uh, it then goes on to talk about the provision only includes the costs which are necessary to be incurred and not associated with continuing activities. Uh, so you can't include anything such as retraining. That's to do with the continuing activities. It's only the specific costs of closing down the business or moving from A to B. OK, there we go. Uh, and that's everything to do, if you like, with your specifics, with regards, is it to your provisions within the standard?